Saheb. But my nickname is Sonia. So uh, I'm an assistant professor of management information system. And you know, I have seven years experience uh, in management information system and I have PhD in SDS, science and technology studies from RPI, Troy, New York. And um, my expertise is on the ethical uh, AI, artificial intelligence and data science, specifically in healthcare. So um, this is about my background, you know, but uh, about my poster, should I tell you about the poster? So the Before poster- you got to the poster, you've been humble about one thing. You are one <laughs> of our four area chairs because yes. <laughs> we are here, Global South and AI virtual posters, yes. and 12 of these posters got selected among many others. And yes. we did this as a double blind process and we didn't tell the world who our, uh, who our uh, area chairs were. Yeah, I was also the area chair, you know, and we, <clears throat> you know, reviewed, you know, papers that were related to, you know, uh, ethics of NLP, natural language processing, you know, so it, it was a blind review and three, re you know, reviewers, you know, blindly reviewed the, the posters and then we selected the ones that, you know, we thought that, you know, is more appropriate and well, you know, developed for the conference. But the other papers, we also gave them, you know, the papers that were not accepted, we gave them enough advice so they could improve and hopefully next year they, you know, attend the conference again, you know, so we didn't let them to get you know disappointed you know so this is what we do we did um but unfortunately i hadn't time to attend the, you know the conference neuropeace but hopefully next year i can see you know i can have active you know uh, participation so uh, for the post poster you want me to talk about the poster now yes you are filling in for somebody as area chair you rejected yes, a lot and you collected a few Yes, I'm feeling for somebody else that because of family issues could then, uh, you know, attend. So uh, the paper that, you know, uh, I'm going to, you know, present is about, you know, gender. Should we go to Utopia or? Yes, we can go to Utopia, but tell a little yeah. bit about the poster one second. Okay. And then I have to find the poster on, on uh, this. Sure. Thing. Yeah. So it doesn't show. <laughs> Sorry, I cannot switch. So let me show it here. How about that? We can do that. Yeah. Let me see. And uh, can I add you so you can share? Yeah, please. Let's do that. And I just went and shared this on. Uh, oh, okay, it works. Topia yes. works. Yeah, Topia works. Uh, let's go to Topia. Okay, then I'm going to give you the option, the option okay. to share. You give me the Topia link for your poster. I will go right there. One second. So Topia is the online world that NeurIPS has created, and it's like a little virtual um, metaverse. Okay, I'm going to go share my screen. And here yeah, I am. Sure. Yes, I'm giving. And it's good if I'm able to just look at your yep. poster directly. Where am I? Here? Yeah, this? it's there. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so I just want to explain one thing because I promised people who are watching that I will be taking them around to amazing posters. So this is the virtual world and Topia is the software that NeuroIPS has decided to use this year. And so when we go to any of the sessions, I have not turned my camera on because I have my camera on on Zoom. Um, I have my audio on here. And I just go, I can go from one poster to another. And here I see Sonia. So I go here. And there are all, there, I see Sonia already there. Okay, I need to turn my mute. Okay. Um, I muted myself there. Okay, uh, Sonia, you can talk. I'm just going to mute myself. Sorry, I'll just mute my cell phone. Um, okay, if I unmute okay, it. Yes, I am here. But you know, it's okay, just Okay, you just need to explain. I'm going to mute my cell phone as one of those. Okay, so. Okay. 
Uh, so uh, this poster is about, you know, gender biases in written language, you know, for example, when it comes to some jobs, you know, employment or jobs, uh, they use a specific gender, you know, pronouns, for, for instance, when they want to talk about doctor, they use he, or when they want to talk, you know, in written language, or even in spoken, you know, people use, for example, for teacher, or for nurses, they use, you know, she. So, in order to reduce the, these gender biases in written language, uh, in written text, you know, um, uh, in Marathi language, we see, you know, uh, this uh, poster talks about how we train data sets that instead of using these gender, you know, pronouns such as she and he uses, you know, uh, the training data set that uses they when it comes to a specific jobs in order to reduce in, uh, gender biases. So this poster is really important in order to reduce, you know, these gender biases by using uh, an bias, unbiased, unbiased, you know, um, data set that do, do not, you know, that doesn't use, you know, she or he and instead uses they as a pronoun. So pronouns, yeah. This is the main uh, specific theme, you know, and the uh, concentration of these poster. Okay. okay. So, okay. I so I don't know. I think you should remove yourself from. No, I got out of there. Oh, so okay. uh, because my my was shared in both places. Yeah. So um, Marathi is this language from India, mm -hmm. and Sonia is filling in for the author who couldn't join live. So she was talking about this. So um, did they take training data and replace all the he and she with they? Is that what they did to train this model? Uh, they haven't, you know, they, um, they haven't done yet, you know, but this is they propose, you know, but they're gonna do that, you know, so okay. for the training data set, they're gonna do that. Yeah. Okay. So instead of he or she, they're gonna use they, you know, so in order to see that how these gender biases can be removed. Okay, so in the entire language, uh, yeah. they would use they will say they and then see if the language, the model itself is unbiased and now it doesn't yes. say a yeah. doctor is a male and a nurse is a female and 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 they have to test it out as the next step. Yeah. Okay. That's that, that's their goal. And I think that was a really interesting topic. You know, we see that um, in many. You know, for example, my language Persian also is the you know um, is the same. You know, but uh, we do not use uh, a specific you know pronouns for a specific you know in our jobs. We don't say she's a doctor. Okay. We use this no neutral language, but many languages they have the the problem is Marathi language. So it's really important that these, you know, countries that their language uses a specific gender pronouns for it jobs, they use neutral, you know, pronouns as well. So I think this is a sample, you know, if this work works, I think that other countries that have the same other languages that have the same issue, they can adopt the same, you know, a strategy by, you know, training data sets that are neutral, gender neutral, you know, yeah. Thank you, Sonia. So one of the things, as I said, when I got started, that what you see in my background is inclusive construct for gender. And we found that in our exercise working with Global South in AI, this gender inequality seemed like a common thing across our languages. Yeah. Our approach with Global South in AI was, yes, there are less uh, data for many languages, uh, that's why it's called low resource languages. We mm -hmm. cannot wait to build a data set. What if we get people to come and build applications that is important for them to solve a problem that they're passionate about? As part of it, let them build a data set. So that was our approach. So that's why we said, give us a reference application. And so that's what you would see in all our different posters. Mm -hmm. So coming back to the gender construct, uh, Susanna Raj, who is one of our other program chairs with me, uh, Yash and uh, Pariya Saran, uh, couldn't join us here today, but she is the, the actual uh, brain behind this inclusive construct concept beyond gender, beyond everything. So we brought that as secondary research and we said, what if we actually do some secondary research instead of just being program chairs and organizers, we are researchers, we love this stuff. So we said, let us take three language from the 12 languages that people have submitted posters and ask people to define uh, the word for women in their language. Mm -hmm. And so I, my mother tongue is a language called Tamil. So 
why I use Tamil. Uh, the other, and that's from India. And then uh, uh, Yaini Yanki, who is also here with her poster uh, mm. from, uh, from uh, South Sudan, her language is Bari. Uh, we asked her to say, what are the different words that define women? And then uh, we uh, enlisted another researcher from uh, Brazil. His name is Tiago Avance Felipe. Uh, he actually uh, said in Brazilian uh, Portuguese, what are the different words for women? And mm. we, that's how we came up with this. And we found that uh, the, la the word indirectly has other, it has ageism buried in it. In, in Bari, it was interesting that the word for somebody who is not got a child or somebody who's a widow is the same word, which means the woman is defined. So that means she doesn't have somebody to take care of her. She doesn't have a male to take care of her. And so the word, the, the word for women is tied to the man or, you know, that's the yeah. assumption. And no, so it Persian really language is not like that. You know, we don't use she or he, we just use, you know, they, you know, that's the way we do, you know? Yes. So I think, you know, other languages, you know, should they adopt the same, you know? Yeah, uh, I would love to, I would love to follow up. So the whole goal with this is we would follow up and do more research yeah. and build yes, exactly. Up. Yeah, right. exactly. I think that's the first step, you know, toward this, you know, challenge, this problem, you know, yeah. yeah. And yeah. I think that their, their paper was really interesting and a very, you know, influential step, you know, toward reducing these gender biases in written language, yeah. Yeah. So I did not know about Persian. Uh, yeah. I had heard in uh, Ugandan language that they don't have this concept of he or she, that everything is neutral. Yeah. Yeah, so we don't have a yeah, wonderful sure. society. And, and the other thing we found in our secondary research is whatever we do, when it is translated back, so we try to remove the bias. So we say, okay, they, we don't, we say they, and so it removes the bias. But when it is translated back to English, English makes it a he or, sh or she for everything. Yeah. So because yeah. there, there is a cultural uh, Puritan thinking that is baked in the language that starts showing up. So uh, our poster was about how we need to define a construct for every word. And, and yeah. this can be we're thinking about women in various different languages, in various different emotional states, in different cultures, in various different settings. This list that you saw yeah. see next to me here, yeah. uh, we, that's our, our, our proposal. So. With that, I want to see whether I can bring somebody else on. Thank you so much, Sonia. I hope sure. you can st uh, stay on. And then while we are visiting the Topia session for somebody else, maybe you should ask question because my mic my, my is going to make that double noise. So I'm not going to oh, okay. Uh, okay. ask oh, question yeah. there. I I'm stay here. Yeah. Okay. Uh, who wants to go? Muskan has been around. Uh, Sundar, if you're not in a hurry, can I ask Muskan to go? Um, time zone wise also, she's been also very patient. Yeah. Um, Muskan, I'm just going to bring you here. So uh, introduce yourself, uh, go off mute, introduce yourself first holistically, and then you can talk about your poster and we can share the, the Topia link. If you put the Tokyo link, Topia link here, I will go back and share that. Oh, I see your uh, uh, Topia link is right here. Okay. So, uh, but then you're going to, once we go to, so introduce yourself. And then once we go to the Topia link, you can start explaining your project and especially I was talking about how we need to bring uh, uh, reference applications for different uh, uh, countries and yours was the one that came to mind for me so I will let you explain that to me go ahead most certainly yes thank you so much uh, so hello world I am Muskan Mahajan I am a student researcher who is very interested at the intersection of natural language processing and education particularly language acquisition. In India, there is a growing importance of English language fluency because at the end of the day, it somewhat influences a person's job and employment prospects along with their social acceptance in a way. So this is what my project was directed towards, making language learning more accessible for the Hindi and the English speaking youth. English being code switched Hindi and English spoken by 350 million speakers all across India. So without further ado, let's uh, hop into uh, Topia and uh, take a look at the poster. And you're also a high school student, I heard, right? Yes, I am. I recently graduated through high school. In fact, uh, the motivation behind uh, creating uh, this Bella is that while in high school, I uh, volunteered and then ultimately led a program called Each One Converse With One 
which is an English language acquisition program. So as we grew in scale, we realized that there uh, that it is difficult to induct more and more language teaching mentors. Yeah. And this is where I thought that we need a personalized language teaching agent, something that a chatbot can achieve. Yeah. That we do develop uh, Bella. Okay. Let me check whether one second. I want to make sure that the YouTube link is here. People can see it. Yes. Okay. They are able to see us. So I'm going to go back to Topia. And let me share my screen. I'll, I'll mute myself as soon as I got in. Okay. Um, where is Topia? Okay. We, I'm just talking to um, Muskan. And I'm just going into Topia. I'm going to mute myself here, essentially. Let me see if I have an option of not allowing a share. No, no, don't allow me. Okay. I entered the world and yeah, I'll start echoing and then I'll mute myself here and you can start talking, Muska. Okay. Yeah. So this is the 3D world they've created from Neuripius and Bella Bot, I'm right here. Okay, it's not echoing so much, so I'm happy. I'm gonna plunk here and wait. Um, you can explain, go off mute and explain. All right, so I got off mute and thankfully there isn't any echo. So I'll start my uh, screen share. Hopefully I couldn't share the poster and you want to do that because I was showing the screen of uh, us at uh, Neuro IPS and it shows your screen. Are you able to see that? Uh, yes, I am. Uh, so the screen that I'll be sharing for the poster that would be within uh, Topia, not uh, Zoom. So okay. we could have... Yes. Okay. Okay. Bella bought for English language acquisition. Hi, uh, Suri, yeah. thank you for joining us. Okay. Should I, can you see this in a bigger view? Uh, yes, so we've got the expand button at the top right of the thumbnail. Uh, left to the mute, yes. Yes, okay. Thank you, Ms. Okay. time. So uh, this is Bella bought for English language acquisition, a language learning chatbot for a youth that largely uh, switches their language from Hindi to English. So I have already discussed the motivation behind creating uh, Bella, which is the growing importance of English language in India. So the objectives that I defined for myself while creating Bella was that I need to mentor these English language learners. So it was my responsibility to survey them and understand what it is that they were looking for from a language learning chatbot. And what I realized is that their expectations are very varied. They want uh, translations to their Hindi and English phrases. At the same time, they want to improve their le uh, listening, speaking, reading, and writing skills through passages, videos. Uh, and when they're done with their classic English language learning tasks, they're also looking for a friend. They're looking for a buddy who they can converse with in English. So I realized that if I were to accommodate all of these expectations, I would have to divide the operation of Bella into two modes, a tutor bot and a buddy bot. So from the given flowchart, you can make out that the design of Bella is as follows, uh, that when a user sends in a query, it passes through a natural language understanding pipeline consisting of a language identifier, an Indic language translator for Hindi language and a machine translator. After the passing through the NLU pipeline, the user queries in a, is in a standardized English format. And then we decide whether the query is related to English language learning or not, after which it is routed to a tutor bot and a buddy bot where it is processed uh, accordingly. So I don't know if we're at a time constraint, but should I also elaborate on what happens in each of these uh, modes? Yeah, I would like to hear more. I just clicked on the topia and I got out of your poster to somebody else's poster, so I had to get out. Um, would you be able to share your, your poster right here? Then we can just see the poster in full. Oh, 
if that's not a hassle. Oh, no, not at all. Uh, if you could give me the screen sharing yes. access, I'll yes. start sharing. You access, yes. So then we can see the full screen here and we can just, uh, you can show us the poster. Sounds great. Andy. Yeah. And uh, uh, thank you, Andrew and Suresh for joining us. So we have like some of our uh, poster uh, authors joining us and Muskan is explaining Bella Bot. Okay, thank you. Yes, so here we have the poster for Bella, what for English language acquisition. You could continue from what you were doing before. Awesome, all right. Yes. Uh, so if you could uh, make out from uh, the flowchart of Bella is that we've got the user query passing through the natural language understanding pipeline. Then it reaches a binary classifier wherein we try to classify is the query related to English language learning or not? Now, how does this classifier work? This binary classifier is built on top of a transformer architecture, which is trained on general language queries and English language queries. The data set was created using Reddit, while as one class which was related to English language queries was custom created by me. If the query is related to English language learning, for example, if a user asks for a word meaning or a translation, then it is routed to the tutor bot. If it is related to general chit chat with the kind that you perform with a friend, then it is routed to the buddy bot. In the buddy bot, buddy bot is basically a large language model, the, in, uh, the very famous GPT-3, which is used to conduct general chit chat with the users. With GPT-3, you can talk uh, to it about almost any topic. However, we kept it restrained to music, food, and environment so that we could prevent the extraction of personally identifiable information, for example, Elon Musk's social security number to a certain extent. Amazing. We have discussed how the buddy bot works. But let's see the tutor bot. Tutor bot has 10 language learning intents associated with it something that I gathered after the said survey. This intent classifier is also multi-class classifier based on top of architecture, uh, sorry, the transformer architecture. If the intent classified is give me a word of the day, then the helper function associated with that intent will create a response and the bot response will be generated. If the intent that is classified by the classifier turns out to be phrase translation, then the appropriate uh, helper function comes into play and generates the response. And this is how the first prototype of Bella works. So you said it was for English, right? So uh, that the translation was into English, but since they are Hindi speakers, they are speaking Hindi, but typing in English Latin script, right? So your data set was all the new data set that you had to create was English script, right? Did you do a mapping to English? Yes, precisely. We uh, conducted a mapping to English and the way we were able to accommodate the Hindi text but written in the Roman script that you're referring to was by using a transliterator, uh, which uh, is a part of the natural language understanding pipeline. So, uh, uh, for example, if a person were, were to ask Mujhe tol ka meaning batao and write it all in uh, the Roman script, then uh, ultimately what would happen is that uh, the language of, uh, the language identifier would recognize that there's an element of Hindi over here and the language transliterator uh, would turn all of that into Dev Nagri script. Now we will pass this Dev Nagri and the Dev Nagri script is the script that Hindi is written in. After it is converted to the Dave Nagri script, we will pass it through a machine translator, something that I got already open sourced from Hugging Face. Okay. And from there, it is converted to your pure English. And that is the standardized form that is ultimately fed to the mode classifier. Okay. What was your biggest challenge in this? The biggest challenge, uh, Honestly, the challenges they kept unraveling as I started doing the tests with the mentors. The first one, the mentees, 
the first challenge being we just can't ex uh, expect there to be a standardized form of english because you have got mentees from so many regions of india using this chatbot then you don't expect the user out, uh, input to be the same and our natural language understanding pipeline is just not robust to all of those queries so that is one pain point that we have to work on the second pain point is to make uh, the uh, buddy bot and the tutor bot more robust to hate speech especially the buddy bot because we have we are currently seeing examples of it generating toxic text so that would be one of my future focuses to fine tune my model on more adversarial examples so that bella does not end up creating a lot of controversy on twitter yeah yeah that's the Can big I ask a question yes so uh thanks so what are you going to do in the future what would be your next step to extend this you know work that you just did yes so yes i'll be happy to dwell on this so my first uh priority would be to extend the support of bella to integrated grammar drills the kind that you perform at school because it currently only supports 10 intents as i mentioned earlier in bella's design and my objective would be to add one more the second a uh, few uh, the second intention that i have for future is something i have discussed already and that is adapting the natural language understanding pipeline to the regional variations of uh, english and i have described the third uh, intention too which is fine tuning the buddy bot on adversarial examples to make it robust to toxic user input so i hope that answers the questions that's awesome um i have to bring other people in this is very helpful so for those of you who are watching on uh, youtube or where i shared this at global south and ai group on uh, linkedin post a question if you see this and uh, later also muskan can come and answer the questions for you any of our authors can come and answer the questions and those of you who are already there on uh, topia go and you know go enjoy it and see the other people right okay um uh, Okay, thank you. You need to stop stop the share, uh, Ms. Khan. So, yeah? yeah. Okay. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm going to bring uh, Sundar. He's been waiting patiently. So, thank you, Sundar. If that's okay with you. Um, Hi. Hi, Sudha. Hi, everybody. So, where is this noise coming from? Some Andrew, can you please move your? Oh, sorry, sorry, <laughs> sorry, yes. sorry. Sorry. We're trying, so sorry. Yeah, we're all trying sorry. to parallel process. Sorry. Okay, we are all on. Uh, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry. Yeah, no problem, no problem. Uh, and hope I'll get to talk. Sorry, to you. sorry, 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 sorry. No problem. Okay, so Sundar. To... Introduce yourself hey. and then tell us about your paper. Sure. We can if you give the uh, link. I would like to go to the actual uh, link on um, Topia. Yeah, I, I placed that link um, a little earlier. It's oh, on yes, the chat. I see it. Yes, because okay. I want to take people to the actual new IPS virtual session, and we can always see your poster and talk to you. But this is special. We are live from new IPS Absolutely. online, right? Yes. Absolutely. Tell us. A, thank you for joining and one of our authors from our double blind peer review process. Uh, I'm very honored to be talking to you all. So uh, Sundar Narayan, talk to us. Tell us about yourself first. And Super. Then, um, yeah. My name is Sundar Narayan. I'm a, um, I'm a AI ethics and uh, governance researcher and uh, a practitioner. Um, uh, I do consult in the area of AI governance and AI ethics. Um, one of the things of um, my focus is to look at um, uh, the risk and ethical uh, equations that needs to be considered in um, uh, in developing um, AI models. How can risk considerations and ethic considerations be embedded in them well uh, in a project level to an enterprise level? Um, my focus uh, on this particular research was about automated mistranslations. It was primarily about language models where they are used in automated translation. Um, and the focus was more on will mistranslation lead to misinformation? That was the thing that we were actually trying to evolve. Um, and uh, the assessment was focused on um, what kind of mistranslations can happen in language models and how can it impact uh, uh, misinformation? I actually picked up um, multilingual language model, which is no languages left behind. This is a model that was open sourced by um, uh, Meta. Uh, actually announced it. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah. In, yeah, 
early June, early June is when they are actually published it. Uh, this language model can translate to and from 200 languages. Yeah. And that's the focus of this uh, language model. One of the things that uh, is useful in this language model is that it has ability uh, to deal with low resource languages, including some of the languages in Global South. And that was the primary reason why I wanted it? to. Do they do that using like zero shot language? Is that what they do? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, zero shot is embedded as part of this. Um, they actually started this project in 2017, 2018, and they built it up at multi layered and then uh, they released uh, this in June or August uh, or this year. For me, uh, the focus was on uh, mistranslation. So mistranslation can typically happen because of multiple reasons. It can happen because of um, uh, the language having sarcasm or um, even having domain specific content or content which is um, uh, missing words or even transliterations or or even dialects that are used um, the idea was to see if we can pick up a data set and then test them to see if mistranslation can lead to misinformation so i picked up um, examples of um, a data set which contained sarcasm uh, ambiguous and domain specific news headlines. So I focused on news headlines so it is, becomes easier for us to um, uh, determine whether that leads to mistranslation or not. Yes. These the samples were used uh, and then uh, I used a uh, NLLB uh, pre-trained model from Hugging Face to translate them. Once it is translated, I evaluated them. About 27% of them were in incomplete translations, so I eliminated them. These are translations which did not complete, uh, have meaningful references of the translation. Out of the 73 percent data, I examined which of them were leading to misinformation because of mistranslation. There were about 23 percent of them. If I have to speak at a category level, um, sarcastic, ambiguous, domain-specific all had 20 to 30 percentage of those instances which resulted in misinformation because of mistranslation. A clear example for that is that um, if Trump was um, roasted for supporting Tony Laren, um, ignoring the actual victims was the news. It got translated into my language of Tamil as Trump was um, shot for supporting Tony Laren instead of actual victims. The meaning is very different. Now we may think that this is only specific to one language. We need to look at it very, very differently because Facebook has integrated it into um, uh, its uh, own set of apps into the meta world. Um, Facebook has declared that they are using it for 25 billion translations every day on Facebook, Instagram, and newsfeed. When this flows onto the news feed and monolinguals who are speaking one language read it, they're going to read it in their language, it's going to lead to misinformation. Yeah. Why am I speaking about monolinguals? There are 40 percentage of the world population who are monolinguals. And uh, I'm, I'm sure um, a platform like Meta will have a significant population of monolinguals who are using um, Facebook as a mode for them to get to know about many things, including news. Um, some of the things that we focused uh, that I focused on as recommendations is that there are there are there are policy based recommendation and practice based recommendations. Sorry, from so, policy sorry, yeah. sorry, Sundar, yeah, go ahead. we will get to the recommendation, but I want to understand the something you said um, that Facebook is using this in billions of translations already, and you were able to find it has a percentage of error. So. I don't know how, what the size of your data set to on how you can you know uh, scale that up, but what percentage of uh, what's the accuracy? Uh, or and can you explain yeah. more about the data set? You know, tell us more about the data set as well. You know, so, yeah, so, I I pop so uh, yeah. can you tell us about the question and then go back to the data set? Thank you for that, Sonia. Sure, so I'll, I'll explain about the performance. So the model is accurate for um, about uh, 70 percentage, um, okay. right? And uh, this is also subjective. 
it, what I'm speaking about is a holistic level. When you look at it from a category performance level, it is much more lesser, right? Um, when I say category, I'm speaking about sarcastic content or content um, which is um, uh, which is domain specific content, as the case may be, right? Um, so the model performance is subjective to the level at which it is trained. The core problem is uh, Tamil is one of the low resource languages and um, the, the translation levels are very limited. Uh, here, the focus of the data set was politics. So uh, it didn't have enough training content, I, it appears. And uh, you, you don't have an evaluation mechanism to test for effectiveness of uh, mistranslations. So that's the core problem that um, uh, the, the paper was attacking. And uh, you know when they did zero shot and said that it understands the language, and since I speak Tamil, and I did not know that was your mother tongue too, um, it's one of the oldest languages in the world. So there is literature and documents and poetry and sculpt, you know, uh, yeah, so the material from the, the temples, but the, not in English. The understanding of low resource is very, very confused uh, in the in the world of uh, machine learning because the low resource is considered basically based on digitized content, not based on real content. At this point in time, because um, English is a convenient language of use for digitization, uh, it appears that English has more content than other languages but um, uh, uh, that that's that's the impression um, but leaving that aside uh, because of the slower pace of digitization of language content languages like tamil telugu or even malayalam or many of the indian languages and many of the global south languages including uh, some of them from latin some of them from south asia are all uh, low resource language resources they, where they don't have enough data set for them to train it on so um, that's the bottom line issue there yeah okay so do you want to talk about the data set question that sonia was asking about yeah uh, to just get back to uh, sonia's data set uh, question what i tried to do was to populate a list of news headlines which were sarcastic which were domain specific which were um, ambiguous and which were general headlines. I populated these independently. These were focused on it having them. And once those were populated, I filtered them for only political news headlines. The data set was focused on political news headlines because the impact of misinformation in political news headlines is much more higher than the rest. So that's how the data set was compiled because these were very focused. Um, I, I, I would say these were attack modes of um, exploring the language model. Um, so these were very focused on gathering the data sets which contain sarcasm or um, domain specific content in it. Okay. Um, do you want to go and uh, see the video yeah. link? Yes. This is, I mean, this is wonderful. I mean, I like research that looks like you've just scratched the surface. That's the beauty with everything we're doing with Global South. We just are like getting started and it's just amazing when we see that. Okay, I'm going to go back to Topia back again. I'm going to reload back and I'll mute myself if it is I'm going to do the echo thing, guys. Okay. Here we go. Here I'm dancing my way in. This is for those of you who are watching and joining in uh, remote and looking at the live stream. I've just entered Topia, which is the online world for um, new IPS virtual posters. And I'm here with the Global South and AI team. Okay, Sundar, take it away. I'm here just going to plonk myself and listen to you. Yeah, I've just shared my poster. Um, you may be able to expand yes. it. Yeah, I did that. Awesome. So um, the focus here is again, um, uh, like I said, news headlines that comes on to a meta platform. Uh, it gets automatically translated from one language to another. 
and then there are some portion of it which leads to mistranslation and those mistranslation gets displayed on the news feed of monolinguals and that results in misinformation now uh, uh, this part of research so mistranslation leading to misinformation is studied earlier but those were studied in the context of um, having a human in the loop in validating them, not necessarily from, it's primarily post-territorial kind of approach uh, for them to validate the news content, but it was not from the perspective of models which are auto-translators. So here, the, the, the problem that we are speaking about is one, um, platforms like Meta are not um, uh, news media. Second, platforms like Meta um, auto translate content where they don't have human in the loop to validate the translations practically, right? And monolinguals who know one language will have faced the challenge of seeing or hearing news which are not actually true. And that's the point of focus here. Uh, the statistics are already there on the, um, uh, on the poster. The thing that I wanted to bring attention on are two parts. One is the kind of uh, recommendations that I have proposed here. Uh, one is, um, and, and the second part that I want to talk about is the future work that I'm working on. The recommendation are three parts. One is when you're actually reading a news feed, the least thing that you can do is to have an option for the user to suggest that this translation seems to be incorrect. That's the way that the platform can gather multi-stakeholder feedback on something that they have implemented, right? Um, that's a feature that's missing currently. Second is that there should be a mechanism to track content which has the higher potential of mistranslation, leading to misinformation. If you're able to track that content within the platform also, you're able to see how additional uh, mistranslation can occur in that environment. Third and more important thing is that there should be robust mechanisms to cross-validate specifically in low resource languages. Generic cross-validation mechanism may not necessarily serve for all the languages. Language-specific cross-validation mechanisms may be required um, for, for uh, ensuring that uh, adequate attention is paid on uh, impact of mis mistranslation. Uh, coming back to the second part on um, what's the future work, I'm expanding this work. I'm expanding this work to create it as a project where I want to collect data set of um, mistranslation led misinformation on news focused on 10 to 12 global South languages. I am not a specialist in all the global South languages, but I'm going to be doing this in collaboration with other stakeholders from Global South and AI and um, other friends. The, idea is that um, on a weekly basis, if I'm able to list out about 50 to 100 news articles and we're able to see which of them lead to mistranslation and compile them as a data set, this data set uh, by the end of a year may be very, very useful to detect mistranslations. That would be another way to limit misinformation. That's uh, that's about my project, and I'm happy to answer any additional questions. Thank you so much, Sundar. I'm sure like, we are going to have a lot of follow-up. Some people who are watching the stream, come back and post questions. So for those of you who are coming back later and watching this, ask your questions, and Sundar will be back to answer that. I'm hoping that, you know, I'm very thankful for, for uh, some of these poster authors uh, who are able to come back, join us on Zoom, not everybody is able to join us because of time zone and stuff, right? Uh, so I appreciate that. So I'm going to stop the share and I'm going to go back. Um, we have Andrew and Yai uh, Niyanki um, here. Let me bring her. Yani, are you here? Are you on the um, uh, Topia World? Uh, I saw Andrew went to the Topia World. So if you're able to join us live, Okay, uh, Andrew, are you able to join us live here on Zoom? Is that okay? And if you can't, that's okay, but we heard your voice when you came in. So I'm assuming at least on audio, you'll be able to join us. And then we can show um, your poster. 
on uh, Topia. You can explain that to us if that's okay. Otherwise, I give the link for your Topia poster and I will just go directly there. Okay. Thank you so much, Sundar. I really appreciate you uh, joining. Okay. Thanks. Bye. Okay. So, uh, Yaini and Andrews, anybody, one of you are able to join here directly? Um, then I would like to see your, uh, at least ask questions here, if it is possible. And it's been a treat for me and uh, Sonia to, you know, come and ask you guys directly, right? You know, uh, instead of just only on, on Topia. And I also want to see the link for your session so that we can directly go there because we've been hopping around a lot. Okay. Uh, okay, looks like they are on Topia, so I'm not saying, seeing them here. So what I'm going to do is, uh, I'm going to jump in straight to share my screen back with Topia uh, and give you the experience before I wrap up. Uh, you know, when I got started, I was like, oh my God, this is such a big world and it's confusing. And I was actually thinking, how are we going to, you know, find all our different uh, uh, authors. But you know what, as I started looking at this, I just realized there are so many, uh, so many uh, other sessions. So let me go see here, curriculum learning for improved femur fraction classification, scheduling data with prior knowledge and uncertainty. I don't know what that is. Um, I'm just here, I don't see the author here. Use of reason-based convolutional neural network model for analyzing unmanned aerial vehicle remote. Wow. Machine learning model for early detection of Irish potato diseases based on crop imagery. I saw one thing, talk of crop imagery. Okay, it threw me out. I'm gonna go back. Uh, <laughs> I mean, I believe the, so it says that hardware acceleration warning, your browser does not support web GL or hardware acceleration is turned off. This metaverse will run in a lower capacity. Okay, no problem. I'm still going to go in and, and crawl slowly. And you know what? They have this funky thing where I can start biking. I'm gonna bike guys. Isn't that cool? Okay. Um, because, okay, so towards Afrocentric AI, this is amazing. I wish I could have heard this author. Can you explain aha moments in artificial intelligence? Deep learning methods for biotic and abiotic stresses detection in fruits and vegetables. Look at this one. I am definitely going to follow up. And the reason why I'm showing you this, I mean, the authors are not here and we are in the tail end of our uh, virtual presentation timing is to show you amazing papers so we can follow up. Gender-based evaluation in Luganda English machine translation. So we're going to go follow up later. Transformer-based Kenyan misselection is one of our Global South uh, in AI uh, paper from Hali Hussein. I don't know if Hali Hussein is there. Uh, if you're here, or oh, maybe I'm muted. Um, let me. No, I'm muted there on the global on the poster. Um, Hali uh, Hussein, if you are able to hear me, I would love to hear more about your poster. Yes. I'm coming from a Zoom, uh, which is live stream to the world <laughs> with a few of the Global South in AI posters. And I know yours is one of our Global South in AI uh, accepted posters. So I just thought maybe you can explain your work. Um, sure. Hello. Yes, we can hear you. Awesome, awesome. Um, so, yeah, welcome. Hello, everyone. Uh, glad to be here. So, let me uh, let me tell. We can hear him. Uh, oh, okay. Good. Sorry. No, no, it, it works now. We could then hear you. Now it works. Okay. And can you share your poster? Will you be able to share a poster? I think there's an option you can share your poster. Then I, um, I am not sure how to activate this okay. option at the moment. Okay, no problem. Um, we'll just see this where 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 uh, I'm seeing this. I'll just show that. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, as I was saying, so Kenyan elections have been like sort of a politically turbulent time in, in uh, 
Kenya with uh, sometimes violence uh, being instigated and uh, some uh, violent uh, events happening. So um, th this idea of, uh, of a dashboard um, came from uh, a Lawyers Hub, uh, which is um, a Kenyan-based uh, 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 Kenyan organization that focuses on policy and, uh, and, and technology. Uh, so um, we we were able to develop a a simple sort of uh, a simple efficient and quick tool that allows us to uh, be able to detect um certain things so let me let me walk you through the pipeline right we we ended up working with uh, twitter data uh, yep. since twitter data was easily uh, accessible um, and we could uh, easily access it using the Twitter API. And then we sourced this Twitter data and we were able to use a pre-trained language identification model um, to look for tweets that have certain hashtags related to the Kenyan election. Uh, and then uh, we were able to identify which tweets were in English. Uh, it would have been great if we were able to uh, fine tune models on, on uh, Swahili or uh, Kenyan, uh, Kenyan English, which is, uh, 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 sort of incorporate some Swahili words and some English words, um, but uh, this was not possible. So we we only chose to work with the English language um, tweets, and then we we utilized two approaches. So the first approach was um, for accounts that are tweeting in the English language, we were able to extract the uh, account metadata and sort of uh, construct uh, construct and train a decision tree based model. Um, that detects whether or not um, this account is likely to be a bot. Um, so from this aspect, we're able to uh, sort of guess which accounts are likely to be bots and which accounts are not. And then from the other side, um, tweets that are in English, we were able to uh, pass it through a pre-trained uh, hate speech detection transformer and a pre-trained sentiment analysis transformer and sort of uh, and sort of try to guess uh, if this to to guess if if a tweet is likely to uh, contain hateful material uh, and to guess the general sentiment of uh, tweeters um, during um, election time. So yeah, th this is uh, this is basically uh, our pipeline. And how did you define hate speech? Because that is a controversy by itself. So this is, we, since we're using a pre-trained model, we had to sort of rely on the training that was done uh, by the, the model itself. Uh, we, we were able to test, uh, like we, we tested the model uh, before before deciding to use it. And if, if you use like explicitly, uh, like if you use offensive language, uh, if you use uh, language that is uh, hateful or language that uh, incorporates like racial slurs or uh, or uh, such type of language, then the model would automatically uh, detect it. Uh, of course, if we had trained our own model, this would have uh, this would have gave us like sort of more control to define yeah. what is and what is not hate speech. But since we were working in a resource uh, in a resource and time constrained uh, environment, this was not possible. Yeah. Um, Sonia, do you have any questions? Okay. No, I don't have. Thank you. Okay. So if uh, if this was if you were able to train your own model and define hate speech in your model, uh, what would be different from a cultural context from Kenya, different from an English trained model from the Western world? Um, I think my Kenyan co-authors would be uh, would be uh, sort of more. Uh, informed um, on on this, and sadly they're they're not currently uh, present. Um, but um, so th they they would have like a more yeah uh, no, a yeah. more general idea. I'm, I'm from Egypt myself, so uh, I, yeah, it's it's a bit of a different context over there. Yeah, no, I didn't mean to put you on the spot. I I'm always curious when I look at language AI that is done, you know, beyond just the english world and that's you know when we're talking global south in ai that there is a, a cultural context to everything which is different from what the ready-made model gives that's why we kind of 
build the model out, right? Anything we get as an API, we just can't use out of the box, right? We are not there. So that was my curiosity question. But this was wonderful. Uh, thank you so much. And uh, I hope, you know, I will get to see where you're taking this, where it goes. And this is like, uh, especially for people who are listening in, this is one of those things that I was talking about where uh, um, we at Global South in AI, we decided to focus on applications that are important for local population. So Kenyan elections and tracking that was more important than building a generic data set for Kenyan language, it is, which is all encompassing. And we'll never get to this place where we have that much uh, volume of, of data that can make it mainstream you know, um, anytime soon, but there are problems that needs to be solved. So this was a classic example of that. So thank you so much, uh, Hali. Uh, hope you enjoy the rest of the uh, new IPS uh, virtual posters. So we're going to, you know, move out from here and, and go look at something else. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Sadha. Appreciate it. Okay, thanks a lot. Thanks. Bye. Bye. Okay. So uh, we are almost at the tail end of the virtual poster session. So uh, I saw Andrew and Yeni just uh, walked in to the Zoom. Um, so uh, if uh, you guys can show share a Topia link of your poster, that would help me. Um, look at how my, my hair is getting cut off on this end and my face is vanishing and that is work that makes And why it shows you black and white? Sorry? You, your face is black and white, it's not colorful. You, you chose that setting? No, I didn't choose any setting. Yeah. I'm wearing a black outfit. But your earring, you know. My is earring is golden and I'm proud. Yeah, of it's golden. black and white. Yeah, it's black oh. and white. <laughs> so there is so much more work that needs to be done to make it inclusive of my face <laughs> in the computer vision world. So. That's for another time. So uh, Andrew and Yanni, if you're here, I would like to see your Topia link. Hi, Andrew. Uh, are you willing to come online and talk to us and tell us about your uh, project? Is Yanni also here? Um, and uh, if you show the Topia link, I would like to go there and then maybe you can talk to us there and uh, tell us what you're doing. And uh, I was thanking you for the input on the Bari language. Andrew, I didn't know you had contributed. Uh, uh, I was thanking Yaini, uh, definitely added her name to the poster right here above me on uh, this inclusive construct for gender. Okay. Uh, um, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear yes, you. Yes, I can hear you. Oh, good, good. Now I just need to find out a way to turn on the... No, no, I the, think you, oh. I had to turn off Topio, so... Okay. Uh, that let me turn on the light. Okay. okay. So um, you can come online, join me. Okay. And I where are you know joining? Where can find the YouTube? No, if you um, uh, the Topia link actually. Okay, so if you go, maybe you can help me. I can help you if you give me the full. If you type the name of your whole talk here. I will go to Topia and find it for you. Sure, sure. Or uh, the other one easiest minute, thing, one minute. Yeah, the easiest thing we can do is I will go to the uh, Affinity Workshops on Global South and AI. Go to Global South and AI Workshop, which is where we were live, right? Uh, and then in there, I will I am able to see all of your presentations, right? So I can find your post. Okay. Aha, I am happy. Sure. So yours is the machine translation model for Bari. Just one. Is that the one? Yes, yes. Okay, I'm going to share. Yes, that. that is it. That is it. Okay, so that here's is. what I'm doing. So I went to, for those of you who are watching and who okay. have access to New IPS or you're going to come back, I went to New IPS, looked at the schedule, found the uh, affinity group Global South and AI. This is where we presented last on the 28th. So the live presentation of our talk is right here. And all the different posters from today's affinity session, all 12 of them are here. So you can actually get the Topia link. Um, 
where is this? So this one, what we heard today, right? The one Sonia was talking to us about is you can see the actual Topia link, you can see the poster. So this is the one I'm going to. Uh, mm. Andrew, I could not add your name. I've added Yaini's name. And here it is. Uh, it's OK. It's OK. It's no problem. Yeah. OK, so okay. I can go to Topia yes. from here. It might create an echo, then I will have to mute myself. And you can come to Topia and talk to me there. OK, uh, so I just navigate to Topia. Yeah, to your own presentation. I'm going to come to here, I'm there. One minute. One minute. Uh, Machine translation for Bari. One minute, I am. For Bari. OK, let me enter the world. I'm entering now. It's just one second. I should be almost there. Almost there. actually i saw you a while back still, when still... yeah i saw you a while back. yeah it was... <laughs> yes it was a... yeah am i okay good good able to log okay, now i'm there i'm gonna flunk myself and sit down yeah, I think I'm in. okay you can start talking you can start talking okay um Everything okay now? And, and wait. Um, I don't see you here. I'm going to move you here, so I'm not. Oh, okay. Just one. Let me, oh, Paria let is me. here. Yeah, I saw Paria come in. Let me just tell her to come to. The, I think. Let me follow. I think I'll just follow you not to you. I think that will be easier way. Okay. Machine translation. I'm just telling Faria or one of our programs. Just I just saw her walk around as a character here. As a character here. Suda, let me walk to you. Okay, now I am walking to you. Let's see. Okay, so hopefully Faria will be able to join us. Sonia, maybe you can come there, and Yaini also can come. To Yine? Yine there. Yine. Yine. I always call her Yani. Yani, she doesn't call her Yani. Correct. <laughs> Let me send her a message to turn on okay. her microphone. Yeah. Okay. Well, hopefully, uh, Sonia, if you're able to join, you can also join the party right here at the machine translation model for Bari language. It's still so okay, good. To hear my own. Yeah, I think okay, good. I think she can hear me. Okay, I'm gonna stop the share for one minute. Stop the share so for one I minute. Can uh -huh. find the poster I can share with you. Anybody else can talk. I'm just going to mute myself. Uh, I think, uh, Andrew, if you want, you can talk. Sorry, my system. And you know, I was going from here to Topia and Hang. Sorry. It's okay. Uh, can everybody hear me now? Yes, we do. I hear you. Yes, we do. I hear you. Okay, good. Okay. Uh, hi, everybody. My name is uh, Andrew, Andrew Anda Wandu. I'm one of the co-authors of Machine Translation Model for Bari Language. Uh, one of my, my co-authors is Yene Yang Inyeka. She's also on the line. Hello. OK, maybe she'll say hello later. Um, OK, uh, first, a bit about myself. Um, I am a lecturer. Andrew, um, I just 
stop yes. the share of my video because I think that was the problem. I think it's not your connection problem. So if I have, I'm on Tokyo and here, the problem. Uh, I'm just going to tell hmm. Korea to come to Zoom. Oh, I should just one minute. Yeah, so the easiest thing we can do is you can share your um, actual um, poster and talk to us. Let me find your poster, okay? Back again. Sure. I think I found it. And... Okay, I have it here. I'm going to share the screen. Yeah, I have it here. I'm going to share, share the poster. Screen. And now you can talk to us, tell us about this. And sorry talk about us, the tell us about you guys. This. Um, guys, uh, it's okay. Um, it's okay. I think I will just um turn off my my video briefly to make the internet connection a little bit. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I'm going to turn off my video too. So. Okay. And with, yeah. Okay. Um, okay. My name is Andrew. As I said, and uh, Andrew and Wando. Of language and linguistics. Specifically, uh, linguistics. So that my interest in in all this. Now, um, our, our 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 model here. What we want to do, me and Ine, is to build a, a language for Bari language. Um, here in South Sudan, we have about sixty-four different uh, groups uh, and different languages, and Bari is one of them. About ten percent of the population. Um, but um, the, the most most of the languages here are low resource languages, and so there's no standard orthography. We picked Bari language just because it's a general diversity and it's our it's our, our closest place to to start. The problem here, of course, is under resourced. Um, uh, underrepresented, uh, underrepresentation of low resource language and machine translation is our obvious problem here. Um, now, what we want to do is to create the model, but first to create the data set. And to do that, I think everybody knows the process of accumulating the data sets to make a parallel, um, parallel corpus of Bari to English. Now, before I, I get into what uh, what the benefits are and why we want to do this, just a little bit about Bari language for just some background. It's, a, it's one of the languages here spoken in South Sudan. There are about one million, one and a half million speakers in South Sudan, about half a million in, di in diaspora in Uganda, in South Sudan, and uh, in, in Sudan rather, and all the world. So about a million speakers. The problem here in South Sudan is literacy. Uh, English is our is our official language and the language of instruction, but literacy is very very low, and most people obviously you know their mother tongue better. So our idea is to make re to to make mother tongue more more accessible, I suppose, to, so that. If material more available in the mother tongue, it would, it would increase literacy. Um, now, people already speak their language. And so you might ask, if they already speak their language, what is the need, where, why do we need to do this? Personally, I come from a background of language teaching, um, education, and there's so much you can do when you're language is written. Um, you can write poems in it, you can write laws in it, you can text people online, you can write emails, and things that you cannot normally do in a languages. And so for us, this is just one way of, of building interest in local languages. People speak it, but it's not given that prominence. And we feel this is an exciting way of, of uh, of getting people involved. So even though the the product at the end of the day is the data set and it's the language model that we will use for machine translation. And for us academics, we want to keep building that model and to keep improving it for 
the social value we see is the inclusivity, bringing people on board, getting excited. Uh, even right now, hello? Yes. Can everyone hear me? <laughs> yes, yes, yes. And we can totally hear you. I have a question for you. Uh, you were talking about how it is sure. useful to have a local language. Uh, so for those of you who are joining us now, uh, Parya Sarin, who is one of our program chairs, has joined in. So say hello to Parya. Uh, she's going to be on mute. Hi. <laughs> Hi, Parya. Uh, sure. So one of the things we are doing is we are just having a couple of our uh, poster authors who are able to join us time zone wise, schedule wise, uh, come in and explain um, their posters. So we did a few of these already. And the way my brain works is I'm always making connections across you know, time zones and, and languages and across the globe and industries. So uh, mm. Andrew, uh, as you were talking about uh, this, uh, why you need your language in a local uh, language, uh, so it allows people to write poetry and law and chat was amazing to hear because we had Bella Bot presented by Muskan, a high schooler from uh, India, uh, teaching people to speak English, but they were Hindi speakers and they were chatting in uh, English script, but using uh, Hindi language. So they were speaking Hindi, their were words were Hindi words, but it was written in Latin script. And so she wanted to build a whole translation model to get people to, to learn English was the goal. So it's very fascinating for me to see that. But I wanted to take a step back. I am not familiar with Bari. Yaini is the one who introduced me to it. And I hope I will be able to learn and you know visit you guys one day, um, especially with her old Google's ICT initiative. I've always you know, want to go there and see all her IOT work from the girls there. Um, but tell me like, you know, from a, from where I sit in Silicon Valley in US, we hear about the 64 ethnic groups and languages of, uh, of South Sudan. And then I see in your poster that this Juba Arabic is largely spoken. So give us a little bit context of the yes. landscape of languages that is out there before you, we come to Bari. And, and you told us why Bari, I got that point. That will help us to understand this in context and maybe oh, sure. connection to other places. Sure, thank you, thank you. Um, just some linguistic context. Um, uh, when we, we, we always mention this number 64, 64 um, languages when we talk about South Sudan. Um, in South Sudan, uh, there are two major language groups in South Sudan. There are the Nilo-Saharan, what's called the Nilo-Saharan language group. The biggest one is the Nilotic languages. So um, I would say about 80% of languages in South Sudan are Nilotic languages. When you say 80%- For context, our sorry, population- Sorry, Andrew, when you say 80%, oh, 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 are there 64 oh, 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 languages? Sorry. There, we, we have about 10 million, our population is about 10 million, or about 11, 11, 12 million. So, and 80% of those 10 million people, um, they speak Nilotic languages. Okay, okay. Uh, now, Nilotic is <laughs> divided into Western, Eastern, and Southern, it's not really important, but Bari is what we call an Eastern Nilotic language. Um, other big languages in that family are um, Maasai language from Kenya, yeah. Turkana, Samburu. Yeah. Um, so those are the other Eastern Nilotic languages, our closest relatives actually. Other Nilotic languages that people might be familiar with are Dinka and Nuer, uh, which are the biggest languages in South Sudan actually. Dinka and Nuer, Shiluk, Luo, Acholi, these are all what we call Western Nilotic languages. Yeah. So uh, Bari is one of the languages and about 10 percent of I would say about 10 percent of the population maybe 1 million um, are Bari speakers um, and this includes all dialects of Bari um, we didn't put this in our poster but Bari has about seven different dialects so in South Sudan sometimes when people say Bari they mean just one dialect that's spoken in Juba here but um, for for me myself uh, we sometimes use it to mean the language family that includes many, you know, seven dialects. 
So in our poster there, we, um, we mentioned that Juba Arabic is actually the, it's actually the, the lingua franca of Juba and actually South Sudan. Now Juba Arabic from the name, you can tell it's a, it's not an Arabic language, it's a Creole, it's a Creole based on Arabic. So 80% of the words of it are Arabic, but the syntax and the, and it, it's, it, it's very different and it includes a lot of actually Bari and local words. So it's a Creole based on Arabic. Uh, it would be the most obvious South Sudanese language to, to work on. Actually, it would be the most obvious language to, to be a national language because it's the only language that, that everybody speaks and unites everybody. But the problem is um, it, it has a lot of political issues involved. And so there's no orthography for it and nobody writes it. People just speak it. And even if you want to develop it, you will face a lot of resistance from both sides, either people who don't like Arabic or people who um, who think it's it's a lesser language for, for some reason. So there's a lot of resistance for us. Um, I, I hope this clears up the- Yeah, yeah, university. yeah. I mean, that's the thing for me, when I got started with this whole global South in AI and tried to understand different languages, because I come from India, we have 22 official languages and uh, there are like thousands of languages, it's not dialects, thousands of languages, uh, each mm -hmm. with our history and uh, literature and, and uh, you know, richness of culture depicted in our language. And so there's a whole uh, movement going on in India to take 16 Indian languages and create translations and translations and you know create the support text support structure to create language uh, translation and models for mm. connecting back to English and that's called AI for Bharat and uh, mm. so when I hear about the 64 uh, languages of Sudan I was like that's too simplistic what is the 64 round number? <laughs> Very math friendly number. It doesn't make sense. Hey, so. uh, to be honest with you, you will um, you, you will find other countries. Um, I don't know how it is in, in other parts of Africa, but it, in, in East Africa, we kind of have this tradition. Every country will have a magic number for you. In Kenya, the magic number is 48. They'll always say 48, but 48, you know, 48 tries, 48, 48. In Tanzania, they'll say 70 something or 100 something. But you are right that uh, it's a, <laughs> the, 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 the truth is uh, it's yeah. not so clear. Yes. So I don't know where that where that number comes from with some, I'm sure it's some kind of Western lens. Oh, oh, where, 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 where it comes from, if you're very curious where it comes from is, um, and I'm sorry if, if, if this goes too back into history. Um, no, I love history. Yeah. Language cannot be separated from history. <laughs> sure, sure. Um, in at independence, okay, at least for 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 Kenya, for Kenya, Uganda, and South Sudan, at at, at independence, um, you you basically define who is it that is a member of this country, um, which is a sad history because before independence, people used to move across borders all the time. But after independence, it was like frozen. Okay, from this date, if you're on this side of the border, you belong to here and belong to here. So these become like the biblical groups of the country, so to speak. So 64 comes from at independence, 1956, the ethnic groups that existed in South Sudan, that these are like, these are now the South Sudanese um, official ethnic groups. And from there, people assume that every ethnic group has its own language, which which is um, it's not so clear, of course, sometimes because yeah. dialects yeah. and people change. So that's where the 64 comes from. That's beautiful. That's beautiful. Mm. So I saw, uh, thank you so much, Andrew, because we cannot understand the, the, the whole concept of global South in AI and adding, adding diversity is not just about, hey, we don't have this, this set of languages, let's build language models for, you know, this set of languages because it is global south languages it comes with you know this whole interwoven with history and and a lot more uh, cultural nuances that are lost to the world at large and even amongst us when we start comparing it's uh, it's amazing how we will uh, 
you know we'll find some common link that's our hope um yeah, yeah. but Absolutely. also we will we will uh, support the unique uh, fabric of each language so thank you for that conversation so coming back to your model uh, yaini got dropped out and she came back so i want to see if uh, yaini uh, feels no. like join, talking to us as the you know um, uh, author of having... paper 2 uh, then i would love to hear her voice uh, and sure. a beautiful picture of you know the uh, language tapestry of uh, uh, south sudan wants me to go learn uh, one of your languages at least and come and uh, you know meet you guys um, so yani if you feel like talking you're welcome uh, to say hello uh, otherwise i have a couple questions and then i'm going to wrap up because we are streaming this and been here for a while uh, our official poster session time our official poster session time why is it echoing me again when i have nothing else open okay so i'm just closing everything else guys uh so it should not have anything else echoing here okay so um i'm not hearing from yani so i'm not going to call on her if she feels like she can jump in any time um paria is not going to be on audio but i just want to show her here i don't think she can come on on uh, video also but uh, I want to thank her for her work with Global South in AI. Before we wrap up, um, this has been an amazing experience. Hello. Yes. Hi, Aini. How are you? Uh, Good. Can you hear me? So we are just getting ready to wrap up. So I was thanking oh. my fellow pro co program chair here for finding time uh, to come in and say hello to us. She's been supporting us, and you all know her. especially from her work with slack and uh, the posters and our website global south in ai.org um so yaini uh, andrew did a very nice job presenting your uh, context of the poster and the company you know and uh, giving a context of the language and stuff uh, i have one question related to the poster itself so maybe you can introduce yourself and then answer the question before we wrap up if that's okay with you you want to introduce yourself uh okay uh -huh. Hi, um, uh, I'm Yine Yenkinika. I'm from Google's ICT Initiative, and on this particular research. Hello. Yes, we can hear you. Can you hear me? Yes, yes, yes. Definitely. Hello. Yes, we can hear you. Totally, we can hear you. Ah, okay. Ah, uh, okay. I thought I. I thought I was kicked out. Okay. Um. You may hear me, Nika. I work with Gogout, and on this particular research, we are doing it together with Andrew from University of Juba, and I'm glad that he did a great job. <laughs> yes, he did. Definitely. <laughs> yes. yes. Awesome. So I have a question on your poster. So um, I heard about the importance of doing this. Uh, Yes. Uh, topic. What was your biggest challenge in getting to this uh, poster? Even to get to the stage of the poster, what was your biggest challenge? So I'm going to share the screen. Refresh it for everybody. Uh, I think apart from. No, I think I think up to I think up to this stage there was no big challenge because I think this is part of the this is part of the work that we daily do at Gogals of translating our ideas into simplified images for people to at least understand what we are trying to communicate. So it was not uh, hard or tricky. and also looking through because we tried to look into some of the some of the text languages like some of the sample text we could use for our particular data sets which has been interesting like really very interesting trying to capture all that information but i think the biggest the biggest load is ahead <laughs> we are really we i think we have to now move out of our comfort zones 
and be able to meet the relevant people we need to to be part of this research or part of this learning and see where it leads to. So I think we'll have to do quite a number of community reach outs to get some concrete facts to make this research a reality. Thank you for that. Um, you yeah. also have a sentence Welcome. here in, your, in the poster which says, majority of the women in our communities are illiterate interpretation of basic policies that affect them are simplified very true yes i have a question related to that um very true yeah in my background here yes, yes. Is, is the poster that we presented mm. at, uh, um, global south in ai at the uh, new ips live session that uh, showed the, mm. let me just come back on video instead of talking you can see what i'm good i'm fading out of here so you can just see the the poster it's struggling to capture me so oh, I'm, yes yeah so uh uh Yanni, you can see your name in here because you contributed to understanding of definition of the word women in multiple languages so we did bari tamil and uh, uh, brazilian portuguese so and that seemed like a very important piece in your uh, yes in your um, I, I, I can see, yes. I've been seeing the poster all over. Yeah. And so talk to me about this this aspect of your your research where you said that uh, women are, uh, most of the women are not educated in your community. Interpretation of basic policies that affect them are simplified. Is that simplified in Bari language? Uh, what was that? What are you simplifying by doing this uh, research? Uh, elaborate on that point here. Yeah. The okay, the simplification of policies. What uh, what we are referring to is okay. In South Sudan, I think the biggest number of uh, school dropouts and people who don't go further in the education are women. That's one. And even for those who have gone to school, most of them tend to stay at home. So with, with time, there is normally a tendency of them losing touch with even what is existing. But interestingly, or something that is very interesting is almost lately, anyone can either afford a smartphone or at least a very basic phone. So simplification of policies, I'm basically looking at as a country, we normally produce so many documents, be policies, be constitutions, and normally the conversation is around women in the communities, women being beneficiaries, women knowing their rights. But interestingly, most of these documents are always in English. And of course, most of the people who are engaged are always the, the, the women who can read and write in English. So you realize we live out a very, a, I mean, a very big group of, uh, of, of women who can't read and write English. So sometimes uh, the implementers go as further as hiring translators to make sure this information is passed on to the women. So it's like uh, the implementers of this kind of projects or constitutions or laws normally will depend on the locals to see this information is translated. But the belief that we have is with this, if we create, of course, this uh, Bari, the Bari language data set, we want it to be an open model where so many people can contribute to it and we see how it can be as inclusive as possible. And we could use it as a basis to actually now build models for the other existing language groups in South Sudan. This is amazing. This is amazing. Um, like I said, this whole inclusive construct for gender was one topic we were we were presenting a second looking at your post you all. So uh, this is such a ground truth that you know uh, English is the language uh, and uneducated people are not going to benefit from even understanding what are the basic rights and laws of, of the land. It's amazing. So I wish you well in this whole project because it has a bigger 
folks, uh, not just to bring their language. Puka, we can hear you. Uh, yeah, Yain, can you turn off your audio, please? We can hear you, Puka. Yain, can you turn off your audio, please? Oh, sorry. Yeah, okay, thank you. Suta, sorry, we couldn't hear you. Can you tell again? Sorry. So what I was saying is, you know, with the work that me and Susanna did with the poster, which is secondary research from the work that we saw from, the, from these 12 uh, accepted posters was the common thread of uh, gender equality. And it is one thing to say gender equality at a very high level. And then to hear uh, Yaini talk about, you know, that women are not educated in age, if un, are uneducated, which means they don't know English, then they don't know the benefits of their own law in their country. It's just, it's just too shocking. So uh, I wish you well on what you're doing with this language uh, translation because it has a bigger, uh, nobler purpose. Um, I also, you know, I said I make this connection across across the globe and multiple things I'm working on. So one of the things that I heard from uh, Professor uh, Avansi, uh, Tiago Felipe Avansi in uh, uh, Port uh, in Brazil is in Brazilian Portuguese. They are having an F effort to decolonize their language. What that means is they have their existing language, uh, and he's a lawyer, so he's focusing from a law perspective, and they said that the way the laws are written are very formal coming from the English world or, or the Portuguese European world. And so they want to make it into simple language that common people in the country can understand so that they can benefit from that law. So it resonates with me because it's a similar concept here, here in your case, it's English and you need it in local language. In their case, even the Brazilian that when people know it is little too uptight and they want to decolonize the language. So there's a lot of beautiful things we can do with language when now in this global south uh, world that uh, in AI that we are going with. So I thank you so much for, uh, for your time and Andrew for uh, giving us the context and helping us understand this. This is beautiful. Um, Suresh just joined us. Suresh, we are almost wrapped up. Since I saw you here, I want to see whether you want to explain what your poster is about, and uh, then we can wrap up for the day. We, this is being live streamed onto YouTube and shared on uh, uh, LinkedIn at the Global South in AI uh, LinkedIn group. So if this is, if you have the bandwidth for it, Suresh, we can uh, show that, or I can just show your poster right here for people since you're here. Suresh, do you have bandwidth to come introduce yourself first? Sure, so that can you hear me? Yes. Okay, awesome. I have a few minutes. Uh, I'll take a few minutes to share with uh, uh, the poster board that uh, I have put together. I am the author and the co-author for another uh, uh, two of the posters, uh, but uh, it's a great opportunity to be here. Uh, don't take it lightly. Uh, uh, like to uh, you know congratulate everybody who is uh, part of. Uh, uh, this particular process and uh, you know who've been selected for uh, presenting here so uh, it's an awesome opportunity so let me uh, take uh, let me share the poster shall, board shall uh, i share your poster right here yeah that'll be nice yes. so that i have the da uh, teaching dance to ai is that what you want to show first do you have to sure sure this is nice <laughs> okay um so the problem statement uh, is, uh, uh, you know, there, there are a lot of uh, dance uh, that uh, from the from the south, uh, from the Indian culture, there is a lot of uh, dance uh, and traditions that happens. Um, you know, as me, uh, 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 this this paper is presented by with uh, uh, Smriti Suresh and myself. Uh, Smriti Suresh has been a dancer and. Uh, when she goes through the dance process, uh, you know, it is hard for people here to really interpret what it actually means. Uh, you know, each of the hand gestures means something in the dance. Uh, and so the problem statement clearly shows, uh, you know, all those hand gestures does not mean much or, they, you know, they do not understand what exactly is mean, but actually they're actually telling a story of 
of uh, you know the ancient uh, folk stories or uh, mythological stories and things like that right the goal we set out for us is to see if we can close the gap uh, and connect uh, the ancient uh, 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 you know uh, traditions uh, uh, to ma make sure people understand uh, you know what has been communicated through the art form um, so the idea of what we are trying to achieve is uh, uh, the first step is to build a data set. Uh, and so, uh, you know, we what we attempted to do is uh, each of those hand forms uh, or gestures uh, has, a, has a name uh, and also it has a English, uh, we, are, we are calling it in English, but, uh, you know, obviously it can be translated to other languages too, but it means something. Uh, so the idea of this particular uh, AI is to uh, collect uh, the data set uh, for the hand gestures and what it actually means. It has a name. Now, uh, and... Sorry, I think I was hearing an echo maybe. And so uh, the next step is to, uh, uh, once we have this data set collected, uh, we would build the AI system which will uh, uh, look at the dance form and be able to communicate the story that has been presented through the dance. Uh, so what we have done here is, uh, you know, we have collected a very, very initial data set. Uh, we have given a form to the data set. And then, you know, we like definitely like to collaborate with others, uh, you know, the, it to, you know, it basically to collect the hand gestures, what it means, uh, and, uh, you know, make sure we have a data set so that the mission can be trained to interpret the dance form. So that is the scope of this particular uh, uh, poster. It is to teach uh, the AI, uh, 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 the system to dance, right? to understand and interpret the that's, dance. That's beautiful, Suresh. Uh, when you originally presented the poster, not the poster, when you started out with the abstract, it was more like a sign language data set, which is what we are seeing on the right, right? It is called right. Pataka and it means clouds or forest. Right? That's right. And so having that image and, an, and a context to understand what it means, right? But that's now right. you're saying this is going, the way the Bharatanatyam dance is done, is a drama and it is telling a story so now you want to do a bit more right other than understanding the sign language aspect of it now you want it to understand computer vision as the dance is happening that is right? right that's where you're going it's beautiful uh, we are short on time so i want to go to your other presentation which i think is in a di different uh, place yeah. right uh, please yeah. let me find you again i'm basically for those of you who are just saying what where am i finding this from i am going to um, neuro IPS uh, to the affinity posters and then uh, in there all the different posters that you saw today are all right there so I'm going to open this other one is called Tamil Kut uh, method and process for creating data set for Madras Tamil yeah okay so here we go um, Andrew loves your poster Suresh well, thank and you. It's, it's high praise coming from them because they set the bar on how to visually beautifully do very clear, <laughs> clear uh, posters. Okay, so slang AI for Tamil language here. This is our very last nice. session. Yeah. We have last uh, last poster we're going to see, and then we're going to wrap up. We're already running late, guys. Um, so in this particular uh, poster, uh, uh, so there is a. Now the current AI systems can translate, uh, you know, uh, language one language to another language, and uh, you know there are multiple languages. The, there's language models to translate uh, those languages. Um, what has been missed, or what has not been taken account for, at least from what I've noticed, is uh, uh, you know all the slang that is happening uh, in a particular language. Uh, so in this in this thing, what I'm doing here is I'm doing I'm building a slang Tamil slang data set. So Tamil is a South Indian language. Now, but that slang has gotten into a lot of uh, uh, movies and uh, you know colloquial you know day to day words. So in this poster, they're saying you know 
even though this person is saying something, it says, you know, do you understand the words that are coming out of my mouth, right? I mean, it was like, if you do not know, this movie is Rush Hour. So, you know, it's a totally different, uh, uh, you know, way of talking and, uh, you know, trying to understand. So it's basically that, right? So if you're going to a particular country or a city, they may express certain things in uh, for each of those languages. For instance, uh, you know, tearing a paper uh, in the Tamil language, you know, they, they would say it as dar. You know, this this may sound like dar. tearing a paper as well. Oh, dar. dar. Even I saw it. I know Tamil, but I did not know what was dar. Right. So they say, you know, uh, uh, I, I, I can speak in my language, but, you know, they say, you know, dar and paper kili. Right, yeah. so something like that, right? So it's actually the how how it sounds uh, is actually the way yeah. they use it, yeah. right? Now, but the current systems will not understand. You know, the, uh, maybe the system will understand tearing means, you know, it means something, right? Yeah. In a particular language, or for instance, uh, you know, the way the way they say tanks is tanks, right? I mean. Uh, so this is this happens in rural rural population, and uh, you know, uh, it's it happens in certain segments of the population. But what happens is the AI is not trained right now to interpret these things. The idea of this particular project or initiative is to build a data set similar to the other one. Right? Uh, there is a if you look, uh, there is a lot of uh, data people have produced in uh, you know. YouTube and other things, but it's not in a form that we can use it to train a model. So the idea of this particular thing is similar to, you know, uh, you have a, a word, the slang word, what it means. And, you know, likely we'll have a sound audio of that particular thing as well, right? So that uh, we can train uh, an audio model uh, to uh, you know, interpret what the person is saying uh, in the slang of the particular language. So this is both of these posters are you know very generic. It is not particular to a particular language, uh, but it's very generic. But uh, that's the first attempt for us to uh, you know get world. That's fantastic. That's this it, is... Sudha. Thank you. Thank you so much, Suresh. This is beautiful. I I can see myself using the the slang. Tamil yeah. <laughs> um, does the word Tamil kuttu, kuttu mean something from where why why it was called Tamil kuttu? Um, it is actually the transformation of the actual word. I mean, uh, in in Tamil they say kuttu songs means it's it's a different uh, you know it 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 uses all different slang words in a song. So that's why we call it as kuttu. Kuttu is all kuttu is, is a word that they use for it. Okay, <laughs> it's okay. basically a slang. Okay. Thank you so much. Okay, Thank so with that, that, I'm going to wrap up, guys. Uh, I've not had a chance to go back and look at your questions out on uh, LinkedIn. So we'll come back over the next few days and next week also to just come back and look at this. And uh, based on your feedback, what particular posters and topics you want to collaborate on or learn more, we can maybe bring them back. We host this thing called Weekly Wednesday uh, Speaker Series. Uh, on Wednesdays morning at nine o'clock here in Silicon Valley, which is evening, uh, 18 hour in uh, Nigeria and uh, uh, Europe. So uh, maybe we will uh, bring some of these and continue on our discussion. Maybe we'll get to collaborate. Mm -hmm. I'm not at all happy at the way my hair is getting cut off in this thing. And some, whoever is watching this, if you're into computer vision or the Zoom people who are building the background, you need to work on this. <laughs> so with that, I am going to uh, wrap up. Uh, first, I'm going to stop the recording. Thank you, everybody, for joining the recording. Thank you, everybody, for the amazing posters, especially, you know, all our area chairs and new IPS for giving us the opportunity and all our congratulations to everybody who presented the poster and to my team, uh, Paria, Yash, uh, Susanna, uh, for hanging in there and getting started on this amazing vision. So this is so beautiful. Uh, we're going to get more than just translation. We're going to get the richness of cultures and across all the all the countries. It's seven thousand plus languages. So uh, I hope to work with you all on some of these. I hope you know you get to collaborate with each other. Um, somebody who's working on any of this related topic, maybe you can collaborate with any of these authors here. And uh, I hope to see more uh, research going forward from here. Thank you, everybody. With that, I'm going to stop the the recording thank you yes 
Uh, thank you. Compliments I see in the comments. Thank you, everybody. Bye. Thank you, Sutha. Have a great day. Thank you, everybody. Bye.